Well, good morning. I already feel like we've had church. We could just give the invitation and go on and eat some pie. <laughs> Well, I do, uh, I do want to thank you so much for allowing me to be here this morning. Um, now, I feel right off the bat, I need to clarify something with all of you. And Brother Virgil, um, I'm going to pick on you for a second, if you don't mind. Is that okay? Okay. So, so many of you have been so gracious to me this morning and welcoming me and hugging me and shaking my hand and everything. And you said, so you're the Texan. I'm really glad the recordings of this will come out after I get back, but um, I need to clarify something. I am not from Texas. I'm from Florida. So I feel like I just need to clarify that. I'm from Leesburg, Florida, close to Orlando, um, born and raised there by my grandparents. Well, not born by my grandparents. That'd be weird. But <laughs> raised by my grandparents there um, for 18 years. So I just want to make clear that I'm a Floridian who transplanted to Texas, and I've repented and come back home. Okay, so are we good? All right, now we can get started. Okay, now that it's done. But with that, um, I do want to thank you. Um, thank you so much for your willingness um, to allow me to come this morning, um, to be with you this week. Um, thank you for the way that you have loved Blake and Julie. Um, they are some of my best friends um, from Texas. I miss them terribly. We're not going to talk about that because feelings, ew. But with that, we love them so much, and you have been so kind and gracious to them. So thank you for that. Um, it has often been said that great moves of God are always preceded by prayer, that God's people who have been bought by his blood, who cry out to him, there is something about that that moves his very heart. And so if you will pray with me, that's how I would like to begin. Lord Jesus, you are good. You are mighty. You are high and lifted up. And God, at this moment, you are reigning over the universe. Jesus, we pause to confess that you are worthy of all worship, all praise, all glory, and all honor. That you are God. That you are king. You are the majesty on high and you are sovereign. Lord Jesus, we would ask that it would be your pleasure that you would move among us, that through the Holy Spirit you would convict hearts. Lord, if there are those here who need to know you, God, we ask that today would be the day of salvation. Lord, for your people who are here, we ask, God, that they would fall more and more in love with you. Lord Jesus, I ask that above all, you would be pleased, and Lord, that we would be faithful. Would you be with us this week? Would you move as only you can, and would you stir hearts to see the King, you, Jesus, as you are? We love you, and we thank you. We ask all these things in Christ's name. Amen. So with that, I need to, uh, I need to let y'all know a little bit of something about me as we get to know, know each other this week. Um, I have worked with teenagers for years. I absolutely love them. They are fun. You never know what's going to happen when you hang out with teenagers. Um, one moment you're talking about Jesus. The next moment you're breaking up a food fight. The moment after that, you're talking about how was Jesus born and how did he relate to his brothers? And then after that, like you're chasing each other around the room. I absolutely love it because you never know what's going to happen. So with that, as I have worked with teenagers for a long time, we won't say how many years, but for a few years, we always have to consider, and the things that will always come up is, you know, guys, what do y'all think about Jesus? That's a good question. You know, what do you think about Jesus? We're at camp or we're at church. We should talk about Jesus. And it's amazing how there is often a theme that goes through that. Jesus often falls into some categories, and I'm going to let you know now, just as a little side thing, um, I'm used to working with teenagers, so if I talk to y'all like teenagers every now and then, will y'all just give me that grace, and we're just going to go with it. Is that okay? All right, good. So there might be things that just appear <laughs> and just happens, but you'll see. But with that, um, there's often these themes that come through as to what they, as to what they think about Jesus. So a lot of times, they can compare him to a paramedic. I know what paramedics do. There's an emergency, dial 911, you call the paramedic. So the paramedic comes and he helps you in times of crisis. Then once the crisis is averted, what does the paramedic do? He goes back. There you go. And you don't call him again until you need something. 
There's the Santa Claus, my personal favorite one. He gives you the presents that you've always wanted, but he only comes once a year and he doesn't desire any type of relationship with you. He just exists to give you what you want. That's a fun one. I like that one. I got a car one year. That was a fun one. There's the grandfather. He's kind of like Jesus, but it gets even better. He gives you exactly what you want. And then not only no deeper relationship, but he doesn't make any demands either. He's just happy that you're there. And then finally, there's the butler. The butler quickly appears to serve you, and then he disappears until you need him again, kind of like that EMT. So what you might say is that a lot of times teenagers have a little Jesus. Like that. Little Jesus is not going to stand up right now because I didn't plan that far ahead. But we're, they were going to say that they have a little Jesus. And you know, what's great about this little Jesus is that, you know, he's flexible. I can make him do what he wants, whatever I want him to do, you know, like touchdown, all that kind of stuff. <laughs> but what's great about this Jesus is I can just pull him out of my pocket when I need him. And then whenever I'm done with whatever I need, I can just stick him right back in and just go about my day. You know, there is a, a growing understanding amongst teenagers and um, in a lot of the church today that these ideas have, have penetrated in. And there's three main uh, beliefs that go along with that. Number one is that God wants me to be a good person. He wants me to do right, be right, be a good citizen. The second thing is that God exists to help take my boo-boos away, to help my hurts and to, to take care of the things that make my life difficult. Make no means. He is the God of all comfort, amen, who comforts us in all of our afflictions so that we can comfort those around us. And the third thing is that, you know, God exists, but he's way out yonder somewhere. You know, he's not really, he's not really too interested in what's going on with me. You know, he wants me to live my life. He's out there doing something. And if y'all are just tuning in, like, this is not true. I just feel like I need to say that right now. <laughs> but with that, um, he exists far off, but he is not involved in the day by day, moment by moment happenings of my life. What's interesting about that is there's a passage of scripture about another church that was dealing with that. It's not common. It, it's not common to today's teenagers or generation or anything like that. It was happening a long time ago as well. This morning, we're going to see that church who also had a little Jesus in mind in Revelation chapter 3. Revelation chapter 3, and we're going to be in verses 14 through 21. Revelation chapter 3. It's the next to the last book before maps. And so there it is. Brother Virgil got that one. <laughs> but it's Revelation chapter 3, verses 14 through 21. I'm sure many of you know much about Revelation. It's written by John. More than likely, um, he is the last disciple alive when he wrote this. And it comes about that he was worshiping on the Lord's day when an angel appeared to him. And he wanted to bear witness to the word of God. And I just want you to hear a little bit. You don't have to turn there from Revelation chapter one about what he saw and what was happening that sets the context for this. Revelation 1, 4 says, John to the seven churches that are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come. And from the seven spirits who are before the throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of kings on earth, to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood, and made us a kingdom, priests to his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. That was a good place for an amen. Thank you, Brother Virgil. So John is sitting there, and he gets the directions from the angel who is there, and he set it up for us. He goes on to write a little bit more about the setting and those things. And then he hears this voice. It's the first place if in your Bible where we may see some red letters. And there's one who's speaking to him. He gives him some words about churches he is writing to. And then John begins to describe the one who is seated on the throne. So let's see what John saw in verse 12. Then I, John, turned to see the voice that was speaking to me. 
And on turning, I saw seven gold lampstands, and in the midst of the lampstands, one like a son of man, clothed in a long robe and with a golden sash around his chest. The hairs of his head were white, like white wool, like snow. His eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze, refined in a furnace, and his voice was like the roar of many waters." In his right hand, he held seven stars, and from his mouth came a sharp sword. And his face was like the sun, shining in full strength. And neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. In verse 14, the Lord begins the letter to the Laodiceans. And after he identifies himself, he immediately goes to their current condition. We see that condition in verse 15. He knows their works, but they are neither hot nor cold. Now, the Laodiceans, that would have made perfect sense to them immediately. He's talking about water. And you're like, well, Lee, how do you know that? I'm so glad you asked. That's great. So in Laodicea, there was a bunch of piping that was connecting them to their water source. They were this great, vibrant, extravagant, beautiful city, but they had one problem. They had nasty water. It was gross. So they weren't like uh, one of the cities up north where all the hot springs were or one of the cities to the east where there were cold, pure waters. You see, Laodicea, they had to get their water piped in. Now, guys, I want y'all to think about something living in Florida. When y'all are out in the yard and it's a hot day and you want to get a drink out of your hose that's been sitting in the sun for a little while, do you take an immediate sip of the water that first comes out? No. No. It's nasty. It's hot. It's been sitting there for a while. And what happens? If you take a sip of that first bit of hot, nasty, stinky water, what's the first thing you want to do? Y'all are so, I love this right now. I'm so excited. So you, you're exactly right. You want to spit it out. Laodicea was known for their nasty, dirty water. So being in the church and knowing all of this, they're like, we're neither hot nor cold. So what in the world? Why is the Lord, what is it about us that the Lord is saying there's something wrong with us to the point that he is so revolted that he wants to spit us out of his mouth? That's not a good place to be. That is not the type of greeting that you want to get. Verses 17 through 19 reveals what's going on. Look there with me, starting in verse 17. For you say, I am rich. I have prospered and I need nothing, not realizing that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may be rich and white garments so that you may clothe yourself and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen and salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see. Those whom I love, I reprove and discipline so be jealous, excuse me, so be zealous and repent. Verse 17 reveals the attitude of the church that brought them to this state. They were rich, they were prosperous, and they needed nothing. See, earlier we talked about Laodicea, how it was this great, beautiful city. And at the time, history records before this was written that there were massive earthquakes leveled the city. Not just Laodicea, but really the entire regions throughout Asia and Europe. 
there was devastation everywhere. And talking to some of you guys, y'all understand a little bit about devastation. But you see, there was something different about Laodicea. See, they were controlled by Rome right now. Rome had taken over. And the Laodiceans, they weren't like those other cities around them. See, the other cities, they had to call Rome for some help. Well, where I'm from, some help. They needed people to come in. They needed help to help rebuild and to restore and all of these things. But you see Laodicea? Mm -mm. They're rich. They had enough money in the bank. Their economy was such before this happened. They could rebuild completely on their own. They needed no help from Rome. They needed no help from around them. They were self-sufficient. They could pull themselves up by their bootstraps. And they needed no one. But you see... Here's the bad thing about the attitudes of the city, is that the city is made up of people. Here's the other thing. So is a church. So oftentimes the attitudes and the beliefs that are happening in the city come in with the people who make up the church. So you see, just as a little aside, we are at Emmanuel Baptist Church, but I am looking at Emmanuel Baptist Church. If this building was not here, Emmanuel Baptist Church would still exist because if you are a believer and this is where you meet, you are Emmanuel Baptist Church. Amen? Amen. There you go. But you see what had happened, this idea of self-sufficiency, of prosperity, of needing nothing, had infiltrated into the church and the people of Laodicea forgot that when it comes to spiritual matters, they are desperately dependent on Jesus. No amount of hard work, no amount of grit, no amount of self-determination can do what only the Spirit of God can do. So the Lord revealed their real state in verse 17. They thought they were prosperous, they thought they needed nothing, but they were wretched, pitiable, Poor, blind, and naked. But in verse 18, the Lord gave them counsel in three ways. He said, buy gold from me refined by fire. Why? So that you can be rich. Buy white garments from me. Why? So that you may be clothed and your shame of being naked may be covered. In verse 18, buy salve to anoint your eyes. Why? So that you may actually see and your vision may be corrected and healed. And then in verse 19, he gives the reason why he is saying such difficult, harsh words to his beloved church. He says, those whom I love, I reprove and discipline. So be zealous and repent. Have you ever noticed some of God's greatest blessings has to come through hardship and difficulty and hard words? The Lord had to expose the issue of their own hearts and their own minds to reveal what was going on because they had been blinded to it with harshness and difficult things to hear to where it got their attention to say, here's your problem. But the beautiful thing about Jesus is that he never reveals something difficult without also providing a way of healing which is why he says, come to me. He says, because I love you, I reprove you, I discipline you. So be zealous and repent. Repentance is a beautiful opportunity from the Lord. Repentance means turning. It means I'm over here and I'm thinking one thing. I'm believing that I'm self-sufficient, that I need no one. That heart is exposed. The Lord points that out to me and he says, leave. Come repent. Come back to me. Come back home, which means, okay, if I'm thinking this way and that's been exposed and I need to repent, I need to come back and turn away from thinking that way and come over here and say, Lord, I'm not self-sufficient. Lord, I'm in desperate need of you. And God, you are giving me the opportunity to give me the best thing in this situation. You see, what's beautiful and what we'll see in a moment, I'm getting ahead of myself, but I'm getting excited, is he's not just offering them those good things that only he can give them. The beautiful thing is that he is offering them himself. 
He's saying, church, come back to me. Come back to the one who gives you the good gifts. Don't be satisfied with the things I'm giving you or your self-sufficiency or yourself. Only be satisfied with me. Church, how satisfied are you this morning? And what are you satisfied with? Beyond that, how dependent are you on Christ? You know, I don't, I don't do dependence very well. Ask Blake. There was one situation in my life I mentioned being um, raised by my grandparents, whom I love dearly. Both of them have gone on to be with the Lord. Um, and there was a situation where I was already in Texas, and as my grandfather and I were caring for my grandmother, I was having to fly back and forth over the period of nine months. Now, being in seminary, I'm sure you can tell I'm very independently wealthy because I work for the seminary, so I'm rolling in dough. It's great. If you can't tell, I'm joking. But if anybody's watching, I'm very thankful for my position at Southwestern Seminary. And all of my needs are met. Thank you. But with that, I decided, knowing everything at 24, I am going to depend on myself to cover all of my travel expenses. I'm going to book my, lot, my flight two hours before I need to leave because there's an emergency back home, you know, which is the best time to buy flights. I'm going to pay for all my stuff while I'm there because I want to depend upon myself and not depend upon my grandfather who is um, who's not only caring for my grandma but wanting to provide for me. Now with all of that, I'm sure all of you who are parents are like, no Lee, that's not how things work. You're not taking advantage. We need to get you home. But see, that's not how it worked in my mind because I hated the idea of wanting to be dependent on anyone else and being a burden upon him. Long story short, Three months later, my grandpa finally shook me enough to get my attention and to help me with that. And I repented. It was a good day. But all of that to say, I don't depend well. And I have a feeling you guys don't either. Because what dependence is saying is that I'm not good enough. And I can't do what needs to happen. Which means I have to depend upon another to make it work. A dear sweet brother of mine who lost his job. Um, I walked with them through that time. And when he got a job, he said something that struck me. He said, we asked him, what are you most thankful for? And his wife jokingly said, a steady paycheck. But he said something. He said, I'm going to, de I'm going to miss the day-by-day -day dependence upon Jesus that a steady paycheck provides. I was like, what are you talking about? You're crazy, you have five kids and I've seen them eat. That's a miracle alone that you feed them. But he said there was a closeness and intimacy that only not having a steady income and a family to support and having to trust the Lord to literally provide their daily bread, the mortgage payment, the health insurance for the child with disabilities. He said, I saw God provide in ways that only God could provide, and I would have not seen it any other way than losing my job. Isn't it amazing that God can turn devastation into blessings? So Emmanuel, how dependent are upon you for Jesus? A great way to evaluate that, that I don't like to think about, mostly because it indicts me, is to think about your prayer life. Your prayer life is a great way to evaluate your desperation for the Lord. And it also reveals our hearts behind it. So as you think about your own personal time of worship this morning, what were your prayers like? I'm sure there were probably prayers of thanksgiving, being thankful to the Lord for another day. We've heard some of those this morning. I'm sure there were prayers of provision. Lord, you've given this. You've been good in this way. But were there prayers of desperation? Were there prayers of 
coming to the place of, Lord Jesus, if you don't act, if you don't move, I don't know what's going to happen. Lord, if you don't move, I don't know if my child will come back home. Lord Jesus, if you don't do something, I don't know if I myself am going to survive the next five minutes. Lord Jesus, if you don't move in Panama City, things are going to continue to decline. Lord Jesus, if you don't move, my child who is far from you, who is lost and continuing towards hell, will not come back. It's the type of dependence and the type of prayer saying that I have reached the end of my rope and Lord, I can't do this. I can't save this. I can't stop this. But Lord, you can. So, Lord, I am coming to you. I am throwing myself before a throne of grace and mercy. And I am saying, Jesus, move. Emmanuel, how desperate are you for Christ this morning? Desperation and repentance was the remedy that Laodicea needed. And the beautiful thing The beautiful thing is that the Lord who knew their hearts and had died for them was the one who was saying, come home, come back. How do you know that he was wanting them back? Well, I'm so glad you asked. Look at verse 20 and 21. Verse 20, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him and he with me. The one who conquers, I will grant him to sit on my throne, as I also conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit has to say. Y'all, the first part of verse 20 is tragic. And it's tragic because Jesus is on the outside of his own church knocking to be let back in. Think about that for a second. Jesus is on the outside of his own church asking to be let back in. And the thing is, is he's not saying this to unbelievers. This is not addressed to the unbelieving world. This is addressed to the church at Laodicea. This is addressed to his bride in Laodicea who meets. He's saying, church, let me back in. Church, Have you noticed that the Lord is missing? Church, who are you worshiping if I'm not there? Y'all, I want to be very clear. I am not saying that I think this is Emmanuel. I don't want you to think I'm coming in and saying y'all are terrible at life. That is the last thing I want to say. But we have to be faithful and ask the question, Am I a person that is dependent upon the Lord? Or is he one that as a church body, through our self-determination, through our self-sufficiency, through our dependence and looking at ourselves, through our actions, and through our prayerlessness as an indicator of that, have we told the Lord, Lord, you can step outside. We've got this. Beyond that, have we done that in our own life? The beautiful thing is that in that there's an invitation. The Lord is knocking because his desire is to come back in. And he promises two things to the one that opens the door. He says, if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with him and he with me. The beautiful thing is that even though the church had come to a place where they've told the Lord to leave, that he is trying to get back in and he says, I will come in and eat with you. What is it about eating? Not because we're Baptist, even though I'm looking forward to that pie in a little bit. There is something beautiful about fellowshipping together and eating together. You don't just let anyone sit around your table. 
What's communicated here is that the Lord desires closeness and intimacy with his people and that he promises to do that. And then he says in verse 21, the second thing he promises, I will grant with him to sit with me on my, fro- on my throne. So I'm sure you're sitting there asking, that's a weird thing. Lee, what's that there for? I'm so glad you asked. That's wonderful. If you couldn't tell, that was a transition. That was great. He invites them to sit on his throne. One of my most beloved friends at Southwestern, Richard Ross, he will often ask us the question, have you ever thought about what happened five minutes after Jesus ascended into heaven? So the Great Commission, you know, Matthew 28, if you're familiar with the scriptures, Jesus has all of his disciples there. They're sitting there. They're talking. They're saying, all, um, all authority has been given unto me. Go, therefore, and make disciples. That's my Jesus voice, if you can't tell. <laughs> he calls them in and he says, all y'all go and make disciples. All authority has been given unto me. And then what happens? He ascends up in the clouds. They know the disciples. They're just like, huh. Then over in Acts, it's like, well, we should go get to work. So they go get to work. And we often think about what happens in Acts, and they go on from there. But have you ever thought as Jesus kept ascending up and up and up, and then they couldn't see him anymore, what happened? Well, Scripture tells us what happened. What happened is, if you will give me a moment of sanctified imagination, what happened is that Jesus came to the gates of heaven. And if you can imagine a long concourse coming through the gates that is ultimately leading to the throne. Okay? So he comes through the gates. There's angels everywhere. There's the saints. There are all the things that is there in God's very presence. He comes down the long concourse. And Psalm 100 says that the father said to them, that the father said to him, be enthroned at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool at your feet. So with that, at that moment, Jesus was enthroned at the right hand of God. Let's think about timing for a second. We know that the scriptures were written before this moment now. It was written in the past. So as it gives us this account of Jesus's ascension, what that's telling us is that that ascension and enthronement happened in the past and has continued on until this very moment. So at this moment, as we are speaking, Christ Jesus is enthroned at the right hand of God. Along with that, they are waiting for all of his enemies, even though it has been given to him, to be made a footstool to him. He has been enthroned, and as we read in Philippians 2, that in the future one day, every tongue will confess that Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So when that happens, someday in the future, everyone will confess that Christ is Lord. Sin and hell and death and Satan and unbelievers will be cast into hell. All things will be made right according to his righteousness and all that he is. And he will make everything new with all power and dominion and authority. And we will reign with him as saints for all eternity. That is a promise and an invitation to reign with him. But church, here's the question. That enthroned king, is that who you worshiped this morning? Is that enthroned king who speaks and the waters calm down? Is that enthroned king the one who speaks and light comes out of nothing? Is the one who has all power and authority and wisdom the one that you were singing to this morning? You see, here's the thing. A little Jesus that fits in my pocket that I can whip out whenever I need something is not a Jesus you lay down your life for, but an enthroned king in heaven is one that you die for. So so Emmanuel, who are you worshiping? Because he is the one who is calling you to repentance this morning. The little Jesus is not worthy of repenting. The little Jesus is not worthy of your life, but an enthroned king in heaven is. It's that king who invites you, if you don't know him, to be reconciled to him this morning. It's that king who says, child, come to me. 
be willing to let me use you how I see fit in your life where I have sovereignly placed you to bring my kingdom where you are. It is the sovereign king who looks down and sees you gather together who says, I have a special plan for Emmanuel Baptist Church for each member who is here by my sovereign act to go out and be salt and light and share the gospel with those who are hurt and who are suffering and who are dying and who are lost. So Emmanuel Baptist Church, will you repent of self-sufficiency and self-dependence and a faith that looks inward? And by God's grace, will you turn and see an enthroned king in heaven and say, Lord, here I am. How will you use me? Our response this morning we have a couple options. This morning you might be here and there might need to be some house cleaning that needs to happen. As a believer, you might be here this morning and there might need to be some repentance and confessing of, Lord, I need to be honest, my life really revolves all around me. My faith is about me. And Jesus I was not created for it to be about me. I was created for it to be all about you. So this morning, you might need to come and, and spend time praying and just crying out to the Lord. The second thing, you might be super self-dependent like I am. What are you depending on Christ for this morning? Are you depending on him, or excuse me, are you depending on yourself to do the things that only his spirit can do? Are you trying to bring life to the church when it's only his spirit who can give life? Are you trying to bring about fruit in your own life when it's only the spirit who can do that? Are you trying to save that family member who just won't come to church when it's only the spirit who can convict of sin and of righteousness and of judgment? The beautiful thing is that the invitation is to repent and come to him and to be received. The third thing, are you here this morning and you know you just need Jesus? None of this makes sense other than that, I don't know who that king guy is, but I know I need him. That same king who reigns in heaven is the one who left heaven, was born of a baby, was born as a baby, grew up, died on a cross, was buried and resurrected so that you can be reconciled to him by repenting, confessing him as Lord, and believing in your heart that God raised him from the dead. And he invites you to come this morning too. And lastly, maybe there's a need that is in your heart that weighs you down so much you don't even speak of it, but that you need to bring to him. Y'all, this is week of revival, which means the altar's open. And hopefully it's open just not because it's revival. <laughs> but there may be a need in your life that only the king of glory can handle. Can I tell you, he's sufficient and he is able. As our musicians come and we come into this time of invitation, I'm going to pray and they're going to be praying. If you need to come for whatever need, you come forward. Brother, Brother Blake will be down front. Brother Virgil will, I will. We would love to minister to you, to share Christ with you. You come do business with God as you see fit. Would you pray with me?